I want to welcome everybody to the Mahindra Humanities Center Celtic Seminar. Um, we're very happy to have here with us today, Dr. Dahl Ilan Stewart of Salmore Ostig on the Isle of Skye, which is part of the University of the Highlands and Islands. Dr. Stewart is a highly respected and widely published early modern historian. His work focuses on worldwide Gaeltach history from the 17th century from indigenous perspectives. <clears throat> and he has a particular interest in the synthesis of documentary and folklore evidence in the writing of history. He has too many publications to name uh, here uh, on a wide range of topics. For instance, he has taken deep dives into the folklore collecting and publishing practices of early folklore collectors, shedding new light on James McPherson's Ossian, on John Francis Campbell's Popular Tales of the West Highlands, and on Alexander Carmichael's Carmina Gadelica. I, I, I always assign one of his articles on the Carmina Gadelica whenever I teach Scottish Gaelic folklore, and he also edited this really lovely 2008 collection <laughs> on uh, which, which my computer is my computer is actually it's it's on top of a whole list a bunch of these ones <laughs> <laughs> oh wonderful i'm using it as using it to prop up the computer <laughs> a great collection uh i i would recommend reading it in addition to to its structural properties um, <laughs> Dr. Stewart has, has also worked with early travel literature about uh, the Gael Tach by folks like Martin Martin and Thomas Pennant. Uh, and he has explored the work of amateur lexicographers, antiquarians, and historians of the 18th century Scottish Gaelic Enlightenment as they strove to forge a modern British imperial Gaelic identity. He also investigates aspects of popular culture, such as charms, keening, witchcraft and second sight in their European context. And along these lines, his talk today is titled Scottish Highland Second Sight, A Second Look. So can we all please welcome uh, Dr. Dahl Ilham Stewart to our seminar today. Thank you for the question. I don't know if you can you she 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 going to she 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 like her real slow her we own uh own an all up uh trust uh he's thinking a whole up and he's on convinced you uh uh yes uh yeah thanks to everybody for uh for for turning out at the at the end of uh at the end of an interesting week uh hope you're all keeping well uh i'm I'll, I'll probably speak for about an hour or so on this topic i could easily speak for much much longer uh, so I might as well get started as soon as possible. This is uh, Highland Second Sight to Second Look, and I'll begin by talking about why I happen to be giving a paper like uh, this and this topic uh, food to you today. So uh, can we move on to the, the next slide? I should have a little, a little bell or something like that. Uh, here we are, just published, caught off the press. Um, I was asked to contribute a paper to a conference at the Edinburgh University Institute for Advanced Studies. A uh, conference run by Julian Gooden and Martha McGill on the supernatural in early modern Scotland. And uh, it was sent to be written up for the conference proceedings. And this handsome volume has just come out from Manchester University Press. Uh, so uh, there's always a bit of a, a sort of a methodological dilemma for Gaelic speakers from the Highlands in these situations. You know, effectively, we're being asked to represent the Highlands and were being asked to give a broad survey picture rather than focusing upon individual events. It's very difficult to do so given the lack of special, specialist background, contextual linguistic knowledge among our listeners and our readers. So let's move on to the next slide. Um, so there can be a lot of background to fill in first, but Second Sight, as you can see, it's a well-known subject. Everybody knows about Second Sight, don't they? And it's regarded as distinctive to the Highlands. So let's move on to the, the next slide quickly. Um, gives us an opportunity to de deconstruct the term second sight, to look at what it actually means, where the term comes from, and how perceptions of the phenomenon change or may have changed over time. And uh, here I'm asking, could it be that second sight might have a history? So let's move on to the next slide. Um, 
uh, Natasha was talking in a very kind introduction about uh, insider perspectives, but I think when we look at Second Sight, we've got to be quite careful about drawing too sharp a contrast between putatively insider and putatively outsider scholarship. Um, Gallic viewpoint is certainly extremely important in order to complement other scholarship written about the Second Sight. Um, but, you know, historical reports by outsiders, they allow us to contextualise the phenomenon. And I suspect, and I hope you might agree with me, when we look at the evidence, our own insider, that is Scottish Gaelic perspectives, may have changed considerably over three centuries. In other words, what we see as being second sight today isn't necessarily what our ancestors might have conceived second sight to mean in 1700, or as we'll see from the final slide, if you're still around, in 1900. And also, when we look at Second Sight, we can see that the phenomena which are implied through the term Second Sight, these may well be widespread throughout Europe. So let's move on to the next slide. A very good example of this is um, of the, the insider-outsider dilemma. Uh, Elizabeth Sutherland researching the brand seer the famous Highland visionary in the late 60s. And she was, she was very surprised in the seer's native island of Lewis to hear from local schoolgirls very detailed accounts of his life and prophecies. Uh, this, however, didn't mean that the tradition was alive and strong because it turned out that the girls had all read about the brand seer in an issue of the Judy comic a few months previously. So it's a nice interaction there of literature and folklore. Let's move on from the Judy comic. So my own investigation of the second sight, it forms part of a wider study on Martin Martin, sky traveller, sky author, who wrote the most influential account of second sight as part of his compendious description of the Western Islands of Scotland, which first came out in 1703. And uh, a crucial part of my research, I should acknowledge, was very generously funded by the British Academy. Uh, let's move on. Now, I was also inspired when I was assisting Michael Hunter in his wonderful source book and edition of Robert Kirk's Secret Commonwealth of Elves and Fairies, published under the title The Occult, uh, the Occult Laboratory. Uh, and uh, if you look at the next slide, you can see some of the, these are the texts that he deals with, everything apart from Martin Martin connected with the Second Sight. And if you look at the next slide after that, we can see that they are all sort of clumped together at the very end of the 17th century. Why are most of them coming from this decade, the 1690s? Well, we'll touch upon that later. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. And uh, you can read Michael's latest thoughts on Second Sight and much else in his recently published The Decline of Magic, Britain in the Enlightenment. Uh, thoroughly recommended. Please buy this book. It's a fascinating demonstration of the messy complexity of how changes in religious belief, intellectual belief and experience actually take place. So my initial plan with this article was quite ambitious. As you can see, I thought that what I'd do was I'd reassess all the late 17th century accounts, including Martin Martin. I'd ask why and how they came to be written at that time, what the authors might have been trying to say, how they differed from each other, uh, because they are very different from each other and they're often quite self-contradictory as well. And then I'd take a, a forward look, looking at the, the, the evidence and these amazing manuscripts, Robert Clegg McLagan manuscripts in the School of Scottish Studies. Then I'd look at Oshan and uh, finally I'd uh, take a leap back to the earliest English language sources to try to work out where the term Second Sight actually came from and why it was used. Uh, next slide. As you can see, that is how it all turned out in terms of time, in terms of number of words permitted. There was absolutely no way I was going to squeeze all that into one article. It would make a very substantial monograph. So as you can see, I had to cut back drastically and I just examined the earlier accounts. I didn't even have time properly to examine these late 17th century accounts that were edited by Michael Hunter. Next slide. And this turned out to be a good thing 
following the law of unintended consequences. Serendipity uh, was at work here. I had to consider the origins of second sight. I had to look at, I had to focus on that. I had to focus on how the, the, the term came to be. And I had to attempt to tie it into a wider European context. And, and because of focusing upon the earliest evidence, I think it was a much better paper. So let's move on. But we still have to start with Martin Martin because he, he gives the most influential and most programmatic statement regarding the phenomenon, as I've said, in his account of the second sight in Irish called Taish. And uh, it's, had, uh, it's had a huge influence on how people see second sight today, both outside and inside the Highlands. So let's move on. Here he is. Uh, he begins by eschewing any presuppositions as to the nature of what might actually be seen by Highland seers. He writes of visions, he writes of objects passively perceived by the second sighted person. It's all very abstract. Let's move on. The thing is, as you can see, the anecdotes related by Martin as proof of the veracity of second sight, they go rather beyond his programmatic statement. They contradict it. Martin writes about visual phenomena, but he also writes about non-visual phenomena, death cries, unusual smells. And he also describes visions involving spirits and what we might call spirit doubles of the living, doppelganger. And let's carry on to the next slide. It's a rough graph uh, about the anecdotes of Martin. Most of them are about death, as you can see. But there, there's, there's more than death in Martin's anecdotes. And just note the even, even, the, even the obvious anecdotes about spirits and uh, spirit doubles. Uh, there's quite a lot of them in his chapter. And let's carry on to the next slide. And as you can see, he ends his chapter. He gives all these anecdotes, not about visions per se, but about the appearances of spirits, familiar spirits such as brownie, brownies and uh, or uh, gruagi, as, as it had been called in Gaelic, and also spirits that appeared in the shape of women, horses, swine, cats, fiery balls, full of men in the fields, sounds, uh, even uh, uh, revenant or ghost singing of her state in the other world. It's very different from his programmatic statement, his initial statement at the beginning of the chapter. Uh, move on. And uh, is this anecdote here, which might be particularly telling here. He's wearing St. John's wort, or fuga daimonum, sewn into his coat neck, his coat lapels. Was this to prevent, was this John Morrison preventing himself seeing visions or to keep spirits or demons at bay? Uh, yeah, Margaret Marty does indeed mean Gaelic by Irish. Uh, he does indeed talk, but he does indeed mean that Gaelic only. Yeah, I'll, I'll, talk, about, I'll talk about that later. Hang, hold, that, hold that question and we'll talk about it at the end uh, of this paper. Uh, so John Morrison, was he keeping spirits or demons at bay? Was this, in fact, a sort of self-exorcism going on to make sure he wouldn't have the second sight of Taishirok? Uh, next slide. Uh, there are even these visions with a, an alarming corporeality. Here's a spirit beating a man so severely so as to obli oblige him to keep his bed for the space of 14 days after. And next slide. So even when we look at Martin's earlier writings, before the description, when he refers to the second sight, again it appears to contradict this programmatic statement about visions and objects and abstractions, which we get at the beginning of the chapter in the description. So here we have him in 1698, talking about St Kilda. He describes the, the island cult leader, Roderick the Impostor, who has sort of taken over the, the, the St Kilda uh, for his cult, uh, endued with that rare faculty of enjoying the second sight, which makes it the more probable that he was haunted by a familiar spirit. And again, in a letter written by Martin, 
uh, to Hans Sloan at the Royal Society, he seems to be joking that the intensity of his thoughts about London could lead to his appearing as a spirit double to Sloan in the metropolis, rather like I'm doing myself on Zoom to you just now. If you had been endued by that, with that rare faculty of the second sight, you could no more avoid seeing of me frequently than the islanders do in the like case. For in the whole course of my late travels, when anything that was remarkable fell under my observation, I presently directed my thoughts. In other words, I thought about your society. So let's, uh, let's move on. So, yep, even though Martin, in his description of 1703, presents second sight as an involuntary, passively experienced visionary phenomenon, many of the anecdotes he presents, and indeed in his own writing, suggests that second sight was understood as a much more capacious term, as he agrees with Reverend Robert Kirk in The Secret Commonwealth, which was written a decade beforehand. So, uh, Martin's, you know, the anecdotes which Martin gives about second sight appear to include beliefs in this learnt capacity of some seers to perceive or even communicate with invisible, capricious, supernatural beings capable of physical action as well as of imparting occult knowledge and power inaccessible or opaque to other mortals. So let's move on. In fact, I would go as far as to say that if you, you know, we can reinterpret almost every single one of the anecdotes retailed by Martin in the description as involving spirits, in particular spirit doubles of the living. Okay, so let's carry on to the next. And this is clearly grounded, as this slide says, with in popular conceptions across Europe of the in, uh, an invisible world populated with creatures who weren't God, they weren't mortal humans, they weren't angels, and they weren't demons. They're creatures that could be friend or foe. And so we have, you know, the, the fluid, diffuse, sometimes self-contradictory beliefs. We're not dealing with a creed or a, an orthodox faith or anything. And the, it's, it's a, a compendium of ideas derived from different sources, um, possibly for indigenous ideas, whatever these might be, but they're also shaped and informed by understandings, concepts and rituals drawn from, as you can see, folklorized Christianity and scholarly disciplines such as theology, demonology, astrology and learned magic and interpretations of observations, the nature of the gift, how it might be acquired, that all that varied from place to place, as well as according to the predilections of individual seers, audiences, and narrators of anecdotes. Again, we're dealing with stories. We're not dealing with, you know, orthodox beliefs in any sense. We're not dealing with a, a religion. Uh, so let's uh, move on to the next slide. And just very quickly in passing, uh, it's important to recognize what I've just said. We're talking about a tale culture as much as actually discussing beliefs which are actually held. We're talking about folk legends, about tales that people would tell to each other. Uh, so let's, uh, these are good books about uh, legends, by the way. Uh, the question is then, why did Martin choose to from these potentially tricky and even dangerous notions of active occult communication with supernatural beings. Well, why? And his discipline across the Highlands during this period. Oh, ah, as Patrick's saying that I'm freezing. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm hoping that you can. Uh, can you hear me all right? You've come in once or twice. Uh, oh, dear. Just in the last minute or so. Yeah. But before that, it was fine. <laughs> That's really annoying. Let's go back a slide and let's try it from then. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for being so uh, forbearing. 
with Isle of Sky Wi-Fi. Uh, so let's try it from here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off my own video. So you're not going to see me, but I hope that you'll be able to hear me better as a result. Uh, so what I was what I was banging on about before is that in a sense, OK, we're dealing with folk beliefs, but we're also dealing with tales about folk beliefs. That is, we're talking about folk legends and uh, there's, uh, the, the, the Germans are ahead of us in this one uh, and the Hungarians. Uh, but uh, there's some room. Uh, frozen again. That's really, really annoying. Uh, can you hear me all right now? Can you hear me? I can. Hello. Right. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks. I'm going to turn myself off again. That is, I'm going to turn off the, the picture. And Natasha, if you can move on to the next slide. That's brilliant. Right. That, as, as Liam said, the, the, the spirits are determined not to get not to let me get to this slide, which is an important slide. Uh, because it, 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 part of the the the. It's a, it's a significant question about why did Martin choose to emphasize second sight as this voluntary, mainly passive phenomenon at the beginning of his chapter on second sight. And as you can see, what I'm trying to suggest is that Martin is trying to sort of quarantine a subset of, a subset of uncanny phenomena. He's separating them off from potentially tricky and dangerous notions of uh, active occult communication with supernatural beings. Uh, so the why did this happen during this period? And remember, the 1690s is a time when a lot of accounts and investigations are going on about Second Sight. Uh, first of all, uh, we have the newly installed Presbyterian Church imposing its discipline and its authority across the region during this decade. Um, there are parish visitations going on. There are active attempts to root out superstition. Also, there is growing social dislocation in the Highlands. There is exceptional mortality because of the severe famine in the later 1690s, King William's seven ill years. And this causes heightened community tensions, which certainly led to some accusations of witchcraft. And also we have the second oh, almost personal reason, because to many of the people who Martin spoke to in London, the very idea of active conversation with spirits was fast becoming credulous, rustic and ludicrous. It didn't go down well in the coffee houses of London. So let's move on from this, uh, this slide and hopefully the spirits will let us. Uh, and let's see, Martin's Gambit, yes, was by no means a new one, even when we look at the earliest history of Second Sight. Uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this, this, uh, this appears. So let's move on to the next slide, Natasha. Thank you. Note in the description, Martin tells us that he has heard anecdotes about phenomena similar to the Second Sight in his travels. Holland, Wales, and the Isle of Man. So let's carry on to the next slide. And we see that indeed Second Sight is not only a Highland phenomenon, it's a folkloric thing in certain other regions of Europe, particularly Westphalia and the Eastern Netherlands. Beliefs and practices concerning premonition and clairvoyance. Um, belief legends are met with elsewhere in Europe. Uh, tales are told, uh, tale culture about these places too. What's important is that in these continental regions, we have, just as with Highland Second Sight, narratives 
about an extrasensory perceptive ability possessed by certain humans and animals alike. As with Second Sight, these local belief legends tell of involuntary premonitions, usually visions, foretelling death and disaster within communities. As in the Highlands, prominence is given to phantom funerals. In these stories, premonitions often have seemingly incongruous perplexing details that on being fulfilled prove their veracity to a previously sceptical disbelieving audience. In other words, they're belief legends and their aim is to convince their audience. So let's carry on to the next slide. And that's the, the German folklore act, atlas. It's to say the least a tarnished source, but you get the idea of the extent and range of the phenomenon here from these little black circles. Uh, let's carry on to the, the next slide. Uh, there's a useful synoptic article uh, in the Encyclopédie des Märchens, uh, which is, is worth you read it. Read it with Google Translate if you don't have any German. It's, it, it's a really good, uh, really good article, uh, well until the last paragraph or so. Uh, let's carry on. But the best one is uh, uh, writings by uh, Gisbert Stotres, uh, really good surveys of northwestern German material on second sight. And this is one of an excellent series of articles accompanying an exhibition on witchcraft and the supernatural. Uh, let's carry on. Here's a couple of Westphalian Spukenkirchen or uh, second sighted seers having visions. And uh, let's carry on. And this is the low German version of Asterix and the Soothsayer, uh, De Spook and Kika. Uh, and let's carry on. And it's nice, you can, you can uh, list the different translations of Asterix and the Soothsayer, Le Devin, offers a nice illustration, albeit in a totally unscholarly manner, of the variety of ways in which different modern European cultures deal with and assess their own folk beliefs dealing with premonition and clairvoyance. Uh, can look at that later. Uh, let's move on. And the, the Dutch as well, there's uh, material, there's scholarly material on Et Vede Gesicht uh, in the Netherlands as well. So let's move on. So we've got these two areas of Northwestern Europe where second sight is a term of use to describe involuntary visions to do with premonition and clairvoyance. And let's move on. The trouble is, uh, the continental examples, they appear to be 19th century regional writers and folklorists adopting the expression second sight into their own language on the model of romantic islandism. So the term second sight applied in Eastern Netherlands and Westphalia comes from Romantic Highlandism. Uh, so here we have uh, this, uh, the, 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 Ur, the, the Ur source for the idea of second sight in Germany, uh, Annette von Troste Hülshoff, uh, her poem there about Vorgeschichte, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, clairvoyance, uh, seeing, well, premonitions. Uh, and then she adds the term, the phrase second sight to it in the, the second edition, 1844. Uh, and the term beds itself down in German after that, as does Zweite Gesicht. And it's just the same in the Netherlands, basically around about the same time with Et Vede Gesicht. Um, what seems to be happening is that continental writers, they remark upon the similarities between visionary accounts in the Scottish Highlands and their own folk narratives in their own regions. And so they adopt the term second sight. We have similar stories, uh, you know, the canonical acquiring of the gift through bodily contact with a seer. You put foot in his foot, hand in his shoulder, or you look through a hole such as a, a knot hole in a piece of wood. Um, but there are differences on the continent uh, because of the more ready availability of wood there compared to the highlands. There are many more premonitions about the conflagration of wooden houses. Uh, and death premonitions in the continent are about wooden coffins rather than about shrouds. Also on the continent, the ability is ascribed to people born specific holy days in the Catholic ritual year, for instance, or to those possessing 
particular physical features or to those born with a col or an amniotic sac. There are differences uh, as well, but basically it's the same. You know, it's the same, it's the same stratum of substratum of folk belief there. Uh, let's carry on. Uh, and there's numerous vernacular terms for these premonitions, uh, you know, in, in the, the, the vernacular languages, which are gathered together under the later umbrella term, second sight or zweites Gesicht. Uh, so let's move on. And it's just the same with Scottish Gaelic. So we'll have a quick look at the terms in Scottish Gaelic and things might become a bit clearer. Uh, let's move on. If you ask people about second sight now, uh, in Gaelic, people will tend to use the term in dialogue, uh, the two sites. And dialogue, he has two sites. Uh, John McInnes has suggested this is probably a calc on an English or a Latin original. Uh, and I probably agree with him. And I hope you will as well once you see the evidence. So let's carry on. Thank you. Uh, most common vernacular term is taish or taish nowadays that means ghost uh, so my two boys will talk about train a taishan, which is as you all know a ghost train uh, train a taishan. but in the past uh, taish was most common term used for a vision an apparition seen in the second sight uh, second sight the faculty of taishroch and it was seen by the seer or the taishar uh, let's move on to the next slide and remember Martin Martin singing a cow to the second side in Irish called Taish. So let's move on. Very quickly, uh, you can look at all this later. Uh, that's the etymology of Taish. They're uh, related long ago, far off to English phantasm, which comes from uh, fino finai in Greek to show. Okay, let's move on. And there are other Gallic terms for apparitions as well. Uh, it's another article which I suppose I should write sometime. Is different Gallic terminologies in different parts of the Highlands for second sight, and indeed different terminology for different phenomena connected with the second sight. Okay, let's move on. So again, this is an important slide. I'm surprised the spirits didn't try to stop me showing this one. Uh, in Gaelic, it is concrete. We have the Taishar, the seer, who sees apparitions of Taishan. It is rare that you will meet with the faculty, the abstract faculty itself, Taishirach. And the same is true on the continent. Uh, you know, we, we, we have names for the, the seer or adjectives referring to the seer. We don't really have that much connected with the facility of seeing. And I think this is quite important because it's an abstract faculty of seeing supernaturally. It's not commonly met with in vernacular. Uh, and the term second sight then stands out because it relates to the ability, it relates to the faculty, and it says nothing in itself about what is seen. And that's unlike in vernacular languages. Uh, so second sight as a primary reference term stands out from vernacular terms used for the phenomenon because of its abstract qualities. Uh, so let's move on again. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a learned term. It's a term used in universities in the Middle Ages. Epistemological hierarchies of perception uh, primarily derived from uh, St. Augustine de Genesi ad Literam. Uh, Threefold uh, division of perception or experience, I suppose you could say. Uh, uh, second sight here is spiritual, visio spiritualis. It's not a typo, incidentally. Uh, so second sight is uh, uh, it's a, it's a learned term used in universities, which did come to play a lasting and significant role, as I write there, in the classifying and interpretation of visionary experiences. Now, let's move on to the next slide. This is very peculiar. You know, why do you get this uncharacteristic designation second sight used in the Scottish Highlands in the early modern period? Um, just note very quickly in passing, again, returning to what I was saying about Martin Martin earlier, the term second sight allows for ambiguity 
It allows for flexibility. It allows us to avoid these potentially tricky, potentially dangerous questions over what is seen, how it's seen, and how it might be assayed, how it might be put to the test. So let's move on to the next slide. We're on a roll at the moment, so let's uh, no breaking up, I hope. Uh, let's move on to the evidence here. Uh, Margaret Campbell, first one. Uh, seemingly earliest occurrence in English of the term second sight, so let's move on. She made a confession. She was accused of witchcraft, and she made a confession the 5th of October 1595 in Carnassery Castle. She was the widow of, as you can see, young John Campbell of Cabroch, and he was alleged to have been closely involved in the assassination of John Campbell of Cawdor at Naples, a major figure uh, in the Campbell kindred, the uh, Campbell of Argyll kindred at this time, three and a half years previously, and even worse, a further plot to murder the young Earl of Argyll himself. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, there's the different places. Now, Margaret Campbell says how the summer after Cawdor's killing, their cousin John Campbell of Ard Kinglas summoned her from her lands on the island of Lismore. Margaret was a witch, and Ard Kinglas wanted to find out how she and other witches in Lorne, that's the, the, the mainland area opposite Lismore, might win him back the favour of the Earl of Argyll. So Margaret says that at least four consultations took place involving witches from Lismore and beyond. They attempted to, to, to discern conspirators' eventual fates, to protect them from weapons, and deflect their opponents' hostility by bewitching them. Uh, so let's move on. And here's her confession, where she mentions second sight. And uh, to cut it short, she doesn't want to incriminate her servant, a woman of Lismore called Madivor, Nick Vilfode, Vicon if She says she is not in witch, but she will she see things to come by some second sicht. So it's an occult ability, but it's involuntary, it's mysterious, and it's deliberately contrasted with the active, purposeful witchcraft of other women that she mentions. Now, my friend Diamond Campbell has been researching the genealogy of the McConaughey Campbells, that is Margaret's kindred, and he finds that, next slide, Margaret Campbell was none other than the widow of Bishop John Carswell. So Bishop John Carswell, this towering figure in the Scottish Gaelic Reformation, was married to a witch. Uh, Carswell was a translator of uh, John Knox's version of the Book of Common Order into Classical Gaelic. That's the first book to be printed in Gaelic, 1567. Uh, let's move on. Towering figure. It's physically, I, I did him for the um, Oxford Dictionary of National Biography and I got the editor sent me a note back saying, great to have a, great to have a seven footer in, in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography is a huge man, uh, towering uh, mentally as well as physically. And in Donald Meek's words, Carswell translated the Reformation itself into Gallic terms. So let's move on. So the question is, was the term second sight a direct translation from Margaret Campbell's confession, which apparently was delivered in Gallic? She couldn't speak English. Um, if that is so, then Margaret may have been adapting into her own interpretive framework a theological expression specifically associated with visions and premonitions. So we see this sort of epistemic transfer from theology into, uh, into witchcraft. Uh, on the other hand, was the term in English or Lowland Scots interpretation of what she said? Maybe she said Taishirok, and that was translated uh, by her translators or interrogators into Second Sight. If so, that translation was most likely by the chief interrogator, Neil Campbell, who himself was Bishop of Argyll, and he's either the son or the stepson-in-law of Margaret herself. It's still sort of cross-fertilisation, I suppose you could say, between disciplines. So let's move on. And we can have a look at the... the in in um, Carswell uses... Uh, Sula Spirita, Spiritalta, uh, to convey Knox's eye spiritual in the baptismal section of Forum Nanoniach. That's uh, the Book of Common Order expounding the creed 
uh, it's part of a long established Christian vocabulary concerning modes of mystical perception experience so being translated and adapted for Protestant worship in Gaelic. So just a, a little question there. Could it be that Bishop John Carswell, uh, along with his university educated clerical collaborators, possibly unwittingly supplied a concept or a conceptual framework out of which developed an expression that would come to be emblematic of Highland supernatural belief? So that's number one. That's evidence number one. Let's move on quickly to evidence number two. Uh, Elspeth Rioch in 1616 um, brought to trial for witchcraft in Kirkwall in Orkney. Let's move on to the next slide. Daughter of the late Don Rioch, uh, Margaret Campbell, I should say, survived, but uh, Elspeth was burnt at the stake for witchcraft. Let's move on and let's have a look at what she, uh, her confession. It must have been recounted in English in our Lowland Scots. There's uh, evidence if you, if you read it. She, she, the, the, the terminology she uses couldn't have been translated from Gaelic. So her story is that age around 12, she had spent eight weeks in Lochaber with her aunt, the wife of Alan Mac El Dowey, who dwelt with her husband in a loch. And on the banks of the loch, while she was there, she seems to have had this uncomfortable encounter with two older men, one in green tartan, the other clad in black. And they, they sort of joshed her, they made fun of her. And this set and train a series of traumatic and alienating events. Uh, in Mortloch in the Eastern Highlands, she met the man again. And he now called himself a fairy man, who was sometime her kinsman. He importuned her and eventually he seemed to lie with her. And as a result, Elspeth apparently lost her power of speech. And subsequently, she led a marginal life as an indigent, uh, ind indigent fortune teller, making signs, sounding, telling and foreshowing to her clients what they had done and what they should do. And she ended up in the Orkney Islands and she was caught up in this, this sort of communal witch hunt incited by new political and religious order in that ar archipelago, which had suffered greatly from a recent ra armed rebellion and disastrous weather conditions the previous year. So let's move on. And here she is talking about uh, the aftermath, basically, of her rape uh, by this uh, man clad in black who said he was a fairy man. For the whelk time, she still continued dumb, going about and deceiving the people, sounding, telling and for showing them what they had done and what they should do. And that by the second sight granted to her in manner foresaid. So that's a mention of the second sight in so Elspeth. Uh, not Ishabel, Elspeth Rioch's case. So let's move on. Uh, there are the places there, Lochaber, Mortloch, and Kirkwall, Orkney, where she was tried and burnt. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, the, the, just in passing, it, it's worth saying this because you can, you know, if you put folklore, if you put history together, then, you know, you, you find that Elspeth's story, it can be made to fit with what we know of contemporary events and circumstances in this period. So let's move on to the next slide. Alan McElduy must be Elan McElduy, that is Alan Cameron, the chief of Clan Cameron. He was married to an unnamed daughter of John Stuart uh, of Appen. And at the end of the 16th century, he lived on an island, the island stronghold of Elan and Grieve in Loch Hill. Uh, so that's where she was. And then she met the man in black in a second time in Mortlock in Strathspey, and contemporary records tell us that there were a family of Riochs, and that's not at all a common name in the Highlands, who lived in the parish then, and they appear for at least 200 years afterwards in parish records. So let's carry on to the next slide. Uh, this, very quickly, you can look at this later. Uh, there are good reasons why people living or families living in the Gordon estate may well have connections with the Stuarts of Appen, daughter of whom was married to Cameron of Loch Hill and was supposedly Elspeth Rioch's aunt. Uh, let's carry on to the next slide. And there is tradition says that a body of Camerons did come to Strathspey, not too far from Mortlock during this period. And we know there's a Cameron hero who wore black at this time, or the generation before Antayer to the Tuaye, 
and folklore said he was one of the Camerons in Strath's Bay, and he eventually returned there. So, uh, you know, there there are we we can we if if we look at her her confession, we can find historical events which correspond to what Elspeth said. Um, if indeed, also I should say, if indeed she she did visit Cameron territory in Lochaber, she would doubtless have heard of and possibly met uh, Goromhul Vor Namaya. Uh, Goromhul was the most famous witch of the Highlands at that time, who lived on Cameron land. So let's carry on to the next slide. Um, now, for this paper, note that in fifteen ninety five the references to some second sect sixteen sixteen we have the second sect. Maybe a suggestion. In the first case, we have a relatively familiar technical concept extended into an unexpected context, perhaps in a purposefully vague manner. And maybe the second case, 1616, suggests that within a generation, the term second sight had become more familiar for the phenomenon under uh, discussion. Um, it looks to me as if Elspeth's accusers were deliberately using her trial as a test case to dismantle a now perhaps more familiar idea of the second sight as a spontaneous and inexplicable visionary faculty, and instead they reconfigured it as a demonic pact deserving the death penalty. Uh, Elspeth's muteness was censured as a ruse. Her intercourse with the fairy man was redefined in court as intercourse with the devil, concerning whom she subsequently confessed that she had subsequently been using, haunting and conversing with. Uh, let's move on then to the next slide. There's just one stray reference to Second Sight in the 17th century in any subsequent witchcraft trial in Scotland. And here, as with Margaret, the faculty is specifically distinguished from active witchcraft. Uh, among the terms brought against Janet Cock of Dalkeith in 1661 was the foretelling that a certain William Mitchell should be hanged. But Janet's lawyer, as you can see, said that she might have done that from conjecture, such threatenings being usually made by persons injured. And if any crime could be inferred from this, it is not sorcery, but that which the lawyers call deuteroscopia, spelt wrongly, which is not libeled. It's uh, not, uh, it's not a, a, a crime. Uh, carry on. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, so why, why so few accusations of second sight made in witchcraft trials? Um, firstly, uh, local communities might have been unwilling to pursue individuals credited with second sight because they weren't seen as harmful witches. Rather, they may have had much in common with the relatively benevolent cunning folk found elsewhere in Europe, the Mranfese in, uh, in Ireland, for instance. Um, secondly, and I thought I'd jump into Massachusetts for at least one slide here, uh, if you look at the, the an analogous faculty of spectral or special sight in 1692 Salem witch trials, in the absence of direct confession of the kind extracted from Elspeth Rioch, spectral testimony on its own was notoriously ambiguous and problematic as it ev evidence in court. It's very, very difficult to prosecute. So you had uh, spectral or, spe or special sight, which is second sight in New England in the 1690s as well. Um, so that's two early episodes in the history of Second Sight, uh, but for the rest of this uh, paper, uh, I'd like briefly to return to the question as to why Second Sight came to such prominence at the end of the 17th century. So let's move on. Let's move quickly on to the next. Um, very briefly, uh, mention very briefly, the theological model of spiritual Second Sight may not only have been adapted into Highland supernatural belief during this period, but into another equally unlikely milieu, that is the establishment and consolidation of speculative Freemasonry, a pro predominantly Scottish phenomenon promising its adepts insights into ancient arcane knowledge, allowing them to penetrate outward appearances to esoteric secrets uh, within. So uh, this poem, for example, uh, is an example of Masonic claims concerning a mysteriously acquired second sight. And you know, I, I think this concept is most likely adapted from contemporary theological discourse rather than, as some have said, uh, taken directly from occult Neoplatonism. And maybe it may have encouraged interest among Scottish Freemasons into parallel assertions of prescience and clairvoyance among their own uh, countrymen. 
but let's move on from the, the Freemasons and uh, say, well, right, we've got interest growing in the uh, interest growing in the Scottish Highlands in general. Get knowledge about the region, its people, society, customs, practices, beliefs collected, analysed and disseminated by cultural brokers on both sides of the Highland line. Prominent in these accounts were anecdotes and conjectures regarding the second site. But I'm going to suggest that the actual stimulus for inve investigations into second site may have arisen in the first place in a quite different part of Scotland, that is the covenanting Western Lowlands. So let's carry on, let's move on and uh, get some bonus evidence here about Jonnet Douglas, 1677-78. Uh, let's move on again. Yeah, two men. Michael Hunter has identified the man on the right here, Robert Boyle, to whom he has devoted his scholarly life as a crucial collector and circulator of facts regarding the second sight. Um, Boyle was motivated by curiosity and deep religiosity, and he regarded trustworthy empirical data regarding preternatural occurrences retailed by credible informants as a means of verifying the independent existence of an active spirit world and challenging the disturbing growth in reductive secular materialism and sceptical and iconoclastic atheism, particularly among metropolitan coffee house wits. So Michael Hunter suggests that Boyle's interest in Second Sight was spurred by an interview with the man on the left, George Mackenzie of Talbot, in 1678. At a time when Boyle seems to have been set, suffering a sort of sense of crisis, he was apprehensive that the witchcraft and wonder narratives on which he had been relying increasingly lacked credibility as proof of a spirit world. And for Boyle, Highland Second Sight narratives offered a new opportunity to test the reality of the preternatural. Uh, and Hunter touches on a narrative that suggests that Second Sight wasn't only an interest shared by Boyle and Mackenzie, but was preoccupying all levels of society in Scotland at this time, particularly in the Western Lowlands. So let's carry on and let's get to the notorious case of Jonet Douglas. I've only got time to deal with it very briefly, but it's a fascinating case. Uh, mute adolescent girl uh, detected hidden hex dolls and denounced uh, people re recklessly uh, and leading to seven executions for witchcraft, two suicides in uh, two towns in the Western Lowlands in three separate trials in early 1677. And she herself was brought to trial in February the following year. Let's carry on, let's move on. Now, Jonet Douglas had been imprisoned by clearly apprehensive authorities to find out where she had got her powers from. And according to Robert Law, a, a, co a covenanting preacher, uh, she declared that she knew not from what spirit, only things were suggested to her, but denied that she had any correspondence with Satan. The best construction that could be put on her, as some think, is that she has a second sight by a compact of her parents with the devil, and that she may be passive in it. And this stance is echoed, as you can see, by the lawyer, Sir John Lauder, who says, um, you know, if it's an involuntary possession or by spirits frequenting of her or by the second sight without a paction, that is a demonic pact, it can never be made criminal. It's her misfortune instead. So let's carry on. Very notorious case. Uh, and it, it suggests that, you, you know, even though second sight doesn't appear that often in written uh, literature, it may well have been uh, a more, more prominent in, in oral popular discourse during this period. Also, it may have been given a new lease of life, the idea of second sight, in the context of the theology then espoused by militant Scottish covenanters in the Western Lowlands. And you can see their belief system there, marked by providentialism, prophecies, spirit possessions, apocalyptic dreams and visions, confrontations with the devil, converse with angels, and the centrality of heart work. It's heightened interior spiritual experience. And that is used, we have second sight used as a term for that uh, experience uh, in a number of uh, tracts, covenanting tracts during this period, including the one there uh, by the Reverend Robert McWard. Uh, next slide, please. 
point here to make is that the second site was seen as a faculty particularly associated with Highlanders. Uh, Johnet Douglas was de described as coming from the north, even though she wasn't. And at the end of 1670s, we also have this pillaging Highland ho host let loose among the refractory covenanting communities in the Western Lowlands. And we've got a nice reminiscence there uh, by a poor Ayrshire farmer about what happened when the Highlanders came to visit. Uh, so well acquaint were they with the second sight that let people hide their goods never so well. Yet these Athel and bred Albain men would go as right to where it was hid, whether beneath or above the ground, as if they had been at the putting of it there, dig it up and away with it, rejoicing as though it had been their own. So Highlanders are connected with the second site during this period in Scotland. And if we go on, um, or just briefly to say the prominence of covenanting perspectives may well have got people in the Western Lowlands used to the idea of second sight, interested in it, whether it's an inner spiritual perception or generally as a supernatural prophetic ability. And maybe it also made people interested in where and why the second sight came about and how it came about as well. Uh, was, it, uh, was it involuntary? Or was it the result of a contract, a pact with either God or with Satan? Let's move on to the next slide. Very febrile atmosphere in Lowland Scotland during this period. Lots of apparitions being seen, lots of portents. So it's hardly surprising that Second Sight becomes. It's a, it's, a, it's a topic that people are talking about. Politicians are talking about and people on the street are talking about in the late 1670s. So what I, I'd like to build on what Michael Hunter is saying and saying that we're not just dealing with intellectual interest in the second sight, we're dealing with popular interest and awareness of second sight, not only in Scotland, but as you can see from the next slide, in London. And this is a piece from Nathaniel Lee's play, The Princess of Cleve, first performed in 1680 in London. And uh, two husbands disguised as fortune tellers and... What did you never hear your second sight men, your dumb Highlanders that tell fortunes? Uh, let's move on to the next slide. It's six o'clock, so we're almost we're almost there. Uh, and Lee's play, you've got earlier on in the play, we've got an allusion to the dumb man, the Highlander that made such a noise, who is presumably a recent arrival to the capital, familiar to the theatre audience. So there must have been a recent notoriety of second sight, not only in London, but in not only in, in Scotland but in London as well. And this is their way of getting a, a niche for themselves in the fortune telling market. There's a nice uh, article in Folklore which has recently appeared uh, about the London fortune telling market, market during the early modern period. Uh, so Highland Second Sight is surely already a topic of discussion and scepticism in metropolitan street culture at a time of heightened awareness and concern regarding importance and prophecy during the exclusion crisis of 1679 to 81. So let's move hurriedly on. Uh, next slide. So anyway, notion of second sight as an involuntary recognition, clairvoyance, it may have sort of emerged out of a much broader spectrum of popular supernatural beliefs and practices, including communication with otherwise invisible spirits. Um, but that's, you know, we can't say that supposedly spontaneous innate experiences allowing access to the supernatural were unknown before the early modern period. And in a sense, the concept of involuntary second sight is reminiscent of other alternative blame mechanisms that worked in Highland communities before the early modern period. We've had fairies, which uh, Ronald Hutton has written a, a very good article about in, uh, in Past and Present. And in particular, I think we have spirit possession or the evil eye, uh, by which maleficium or the power to evil, it might be ascribed to certain individuals in a locality, yet you are not necessarily invoking active, spiteful intent. And this can alleviate, if not end, disruptive community tensions, uh, alternative blame mechanisms, which I bore my students senseless with my folklore courses. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so maybe the innovative step taken in the post-Reformation era was when these 
some of these these phenomena, these experiences, supposedly innate, passive, they're grouped together under a designation second sight. Uh, and this is at least partly framed in order to circumvent the aggressive stance taken against demonically inspired malefica by religious reformers. So what, what I'm trying to say here is the history of second sight might suggest that some popular beliefs had a reformation and enlightenment as well. They weren't this sort of stagnant sump uh, standing to the side of intellectual and, and religious trends of the period. Uh, but, you know, the, it changes. These popular beliefs change as intellectual belief changes, as religious belief changes as well. So let's move on to the next slide for further investigation. Oh, just yes, let's move on. Let's quickly. Um, why, you know, why, why were uh, was Second Sight connected with the Highlands? Well, it might just be because it's a remote region and supernatural tends to stick to remote mountainous regions. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, there wasn't a lot of cheap religious material available in Gaelic in print. And this and the, the huge parishes in the Highlands meant that across much of the region, Orthodox ecclesiastical perspectives were only weakly acculturated among the people until the 18th century. Uh, and as a result, uh, you know, stories about these phenomena, they continued to be interpreted according to older, much more heterogeneous beliefs. You know, they weren't assimilated to sort of narrowly dualistic theological assumptions and treated either as numinous examples of divine providence or diabolic temp temptation, as they were in other places. These stories also they remain part of mundane community discourse. And this may have given the impression to people on the outside that instances of second sight were experienced more frequently and more multifariously in that region, and thus they came to be seen as being distinctively highland in their nature. So let's move on to the next slide. Uh, nearly done. Uh, yeah, it's it's interesting that this interest in second sight parallels the growth of mysticism, you know, interiorized, often passive interactions with the divine across much of Western Europe. Uh, we've seen it with Covenanters, but we can trace it, you know, through Anabaptists, early Pietism, uh, Episcopalian Quietism in, in Scotland, in the Lowlands, and in Counter Reformation. Catholicism as well. So let's let's move on to the next slide. Gender dimension, which I should have dealt with much greater detail. Uh, second sight beliefs they allow a voice to non-literate monoglot Gallic tenants and servants. Uh, in early modern accounts, you know, given by Kirk, given by Martin, these tend to be male rather than female visionaries. But you know, we, we have this problem. It's the same with mysticism. Second sight leaves its believers open to these charges of excess credulity and irrational enthusiasm. So the reports that we have in the second sight from this period may have stressed male rather than female seers in order to bolster the credibility of the phenomenon. Uh, so let's let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so the story of the second sight after the 17th century remains to be traced. It's a long process by which earlier models of active engagement with the supernatural other world gradually fade away and they leave the modern concept of an innate involuntary capacity somehow to see events in the future or less commonly at a distance. So I've, I've suggested one or two reasons here. Religious orthodoxy spreads, increasing knowledge of the English language spread and through English we get the acculturation of these influential explanatory frameworks and I'd like to suggest that Martin Martin in particular is central to this. And through this, Second Sight was redefined as characteristically and exceptionally Highland. It's exoticized, romanticized, and reinterpreted according to outside understandings of what prophecy could and should involve. So we're nearly at the end. Thanks for uh, hanging around. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, this, this, is a, this is an encyclopedia. It really does raise extremely complex issues concerning the history of that slippery, horrible term experience. Um, it may be that in the early modern period we see this re-evaluation of experience. Um, experientia previously could be both an active or a passive engagement with the world. And increasingly during the early modern period, it may be that a sort of passive understanding of the nature of experience gains 
the upper hand. So the shift in people's ideas about the second sight under students' engagement with the spirit world may mirror these wider transformations in human perception in, in, in Western Europe. So let's move on from that. Uh, here is, what did most people actually believe? This is the last thing, another final couple of minutes. Was there, did there continue to be a disconnect between the notion of a passive visionary faculty, let's call it second sight, and a more active involvement in a world of spirits? Spirit doubles, doubles of living people, let's call it Taishirok. Uh, I think that there was, and I suspect the process by which one notion superseded the other took rather a long time. So we'll finish off with some examples. This is uh, an example. This is a wonderful writer, social historian, John Ramsey of Octor Tyre, a real hero of mine. Uh, he, was, he made a trip to Appen in 1769. And when he was there, he met this Macon from Mull, who was a vagrant who sub subsisted by his pretensions to divination and the knowledge of herbs. Um, so Ramsey, and it's like Martin, he begins his account with a description of spontaneous involuntary second sight. But Macon, when he talks about what he understood as second sight, um, it's not just second sight, but it's also a power of preventing the operations of witches and spirits, which at last he affirmed he often saw and conversed with. So for Ramsey, Ramsey said, you know, Macon's interesting because He's speaking without disguise the notions which a century before had passed current among the Highlanders of every rank. And it's very interesting what he says here about him. Uh, Macon's reputation was very low with the gentry and the better sort of people. Yet, note well this, they who understood no English became tubes to his pretended skill in curing or preventing disease in cattle. So in this particular locality, at least, monoglot gales, resistant to change, they had remained conservative in their beliefs. And let's carry on to see what the local minister says. Four years after Ramsey of Octor Tyre, Dr. Johnson journeys to the Hebrides. And he's quite positive about the second sight. He closely follows Martin. Uh, after all, he had, he had read Martin in his youth. He says the faculty is an involuntary affection, um, no temptation to feign. Their heroes, he, heroes have no motive to encourage the imposture. Donald McNichol of Lismore and Appen in his commentary on Johnson, really criticises the doctor big time. It's labouring under a very gross mistake. And uh, as you can see, um, it's clear that Nichols' idea of the second sight wasn't derived from Martin Martin, but from the still persisting older beliefs that his traditional Taishirok, epitomised by his erstwhile parishioner, Macon. Um, you can see it's a well-known fact those who pretended to the second sight always considered it as a peculiar distinct, distinction of which were not a little vain. Um, <clears throat> desires of pleasing, as believing they had a communication with a superior order of beings. Whether the artful might not find here a temptation for imposture, I shall leave the reader to judge. So when, when McNichol is criticising Johnson about the second sight, they've got totally different perceptions about what the second sight is. It means different things to the doctor from Litchfield and to the minister from Glenorchy. So let's move on to the final slide. Here we are, almost final slide, penultimate slide. Even in the Robert Craig McLagan papers gathered from 1895 onwards, it's obvious that apparitions are still regarded by many among the older generation as spirit doubles of the living rather than revenant ghosts. So let's finish up with that last slide. And uh, oh, while you're asking the questions, you can read some of the examples given in Robert Craig McLagan uh, about how even in 1900, beliefs in spirit doubles was uh, much stronger than we might think. There's uh, McNichol's, McNichol's uh, critique, his, um, his remarks, isn't it? Remarks on Dr. Johnson. Uh, if you look up McNichol's, Donald McNichol remarks, 1779, and 
there we are thanks margaret for that uh, for that question at the end there so thanks very much uh, thanks for thanks for hanging around i thought i'd be getting a bit of the farewell symphony and people people disappearing off uh, during the speech but uh, uh, looks like most people have hung around so thank you very much uh, and uh, yeah please if you've got any questions whatsoever uh, concerning the second site and history of the second site just uh, just uh, drop me a line that was a wonderful wonderful talk